Dear all, welcome to the Anamet Library Talks, organized in collaboration with Anamet Library and the History Foundation, Tarif Vakfı. Uh, today we are hosting two distinguished scholars. Today's talk entitled Great Power Politics and the Modern Invention of Byzantium will be given by Antoni Kardelis, and it will be moderated by young Richard Kim. This talk will explore the politics of invention for the term Byzantium, which we refer to a society that never used this word for themselves. Our speakers will analyze the role of significant events in, in the 19th century that initiated uh, the invention of this term. Formerly overlooked, but a fascinating topic is going to be shared with us tonight um, or uh, this morning, depending on where you are connecting. Uh, on that note, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Anthony Caldelis is professor of a professor and chair of classics at the Ohio State University. He has published number, numerous books on Byzantine history, culture, and literature, and um, translated many Byzantine historians' works into English. He is currently um, working on a comprehensive history of the Eastern Empire from 324 to 1461 AD. Um, and I can assure you that we are looking forward for this new publication. Um, young Richard Kim is Associate Professor and Head of Classics and, uh, and Mediterranean Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He is a scholar of the ancient Mediterranean world with expertise in late antiquity, late ancient Christianity and early Byzantium. Uh, his book on Epiphanius of Salem's won the 2016 North American Patristic Society Best First Book Prize, and he's the editor of the Cambridge Companion to the Council of Nicaea, and his current research is on Cyprus in late antiquity. Thank you both for being here. And last but not least, dear audience, uh, this talk is being recorded. Your microphones are muted and your camera is off. Uh, you may type your questions on the chat section and your questions will be asked in the Q&A session. Thank you all. And now I will pass the floor to young Richard Kim. Thank you so much, Daphne, for that introduction. Um, and uh, greetings to everyone out there. Um, I can't see you, but I know you can see me and you can see Anthony. And uh, we're just uh, so glad to, to be here and, to, uh, and for me to, to moderate this discussion. And so um, in today's discussion, uh, we're gonna make the case that the category uh, Byzantium was created by modern historians, not because it somehow best reflects the realities of the civilization that it studies, it was instead the product of great power politics, chiefly of the 19th century. Byzantium uh, was what was left over when other labels that had been used in the past were retired for political reasons, specifically because they interfered with the imperial interests and ideologies of the great powers. Since the 19th century, the category of Byzantium has acquired a range of political significations, which differ dramatically depending on one's position and interests. In some times and places, it's intensely conservative, and in others, or has been, it has uh, been subversive and countercultural. It can reinforce national narratives or challenge them. So um, before we get into the meat of our discussion, uh, we thought it would be important for each of us, uh, Anthony and I, to, to offer some personal reflections uh, to, uh, to disclose and to, to sort of set up our own position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the study of Byzantium to show how the category is coded politically, uh, albeit differently by person and context. So Anthony, if you could start by uh, sharing a little bit, I, I'd appreciate that very much. Thank you, Young. Um, I also wanna thank the, uh, all the organizers of this event uh, and the audience for tur uh, turning out, uh, wherever you are and whether it's morning or evening for you. Uh, so before we turn to the, um, the nitty gritty of the historical process that created the term Byzantium that we all sort of operate in, it is important to note that it is politically coded um, in many various ways. And, and I think it's important for us to also talk about how we feel that politics uh, as we interact with the field. Um, so for example, uh, I, I'm aware of, of how it might look for someone of partial Greek descent, such as myself, to be studying Byzantium. Uh, in, in Greece, 
Byzantium is generally coded on the right, political right, sometimes a far right. Um, and so that creates certain political expectations when people tell them, when I tell people that I study Byzantium, um, just to give a, I mean, a really personal example, you know, my, my father and uncle are proud communists. And while they might also be proud of what I accomplish academically, they're, they're still not sure exactly why I am working on Byzantium. Like what on earth drove me to that field, uh, which politically reads rather odd to, you know, sort of progressive modern Greek. Um, in many cases, Byzantium can be encoded on the far right. Um, and I'm often taken as being uh, very associated with the Orthodox Church in Greece. Like, oh, you work on Byzantium, you must be sort of really into, uh, you know, e either belong to some paraclesiastical church group or something like that. Um, this isn't obviously universal, but um, that's kind of where uh, Byzantium lies on the spectrum uh, of, you know, political affiliations. Um, and it is not unreasonable to assume that, you know, Greek scholars who work on Byzantium possibly have some sort of nationalist agenda. This, this does happen pretty often. Um, and a, a scholar in the UK has read me that way, that like I'm working through my national, you know, background and working out issues uh, because I am a partial Greek origin and work on Byzantium. So that's kind of assumed. I should also shine some light on the flip side of that, which is that Sometimes Western scholars who don't have those kinds of, you know, ethnic, national, religious associations with Byzantium tend to assume that their position is one of sort of more pure objective scholarship uh, and, and that they, they're free of those kinds of entanglements. And uh, that's often not the case, um, as we will say, especially with scholars in the UK who are formally affiliated with the British Empire. The British Empire had quite a role to play in the invention of the category Byzantium, so very entangled. Um, so, Young, how, how do you perceive it? Yeah, I really appreciate kind of that personal reflection because um, for me, obviously, by my own appearance, I don't have any immediate connection to Byzantium or Greece or to any of its legacy. Um, but what got me into the field was uh, actually my initial interest in the history of Christianity. Uh, and so as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student, um, I studied uh, late antique or late ancient Christianity in particular, um, Epiphanios, the, this famous uh, bishop from the island of Cyprus. And in fact, uh, I, my family and I, we even lived in Cyprus. And it was really interesting to um, interact with people as they would hear that I'm writing a book on Epiphanios. They thought it was the most bizarre thing to have this Korean American uh, man come from the United States to Cyprus to write about Epiphanios. Um, but, you know, I think they, they, most people that I interacted with were quite um, uh, tickled, you know, that, 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 they, that they thought it was a, an interesting thing. Um, but I think one, one point of this sort of conversation about the kind of political positioning is that um, for a time I, I worked, um, I left the academy and I worked for a, a Greek foundation. Uh, as a director of educational programs. And actually in my time there, one of the things I was interested initially in doing was um, supporting Byzantine studies uh, financially um, um, through grants and this kind of thing. Uh, but when I brought up the, the subject of Byzantine studies or Byzantium to my colleagues, uh, I was almost met with, uh, <laughs> uh, certainly with silence, but almost a sense of why would we do anything with Byzantium. And as I investigated and, and sort of pried a little bit further, uh, what I had come to realize was that the, the um, anything relating to, to Byzantium and its studies was so closely tied to um, uh, the Orthodox Church that there was, there was really, for my colleagues, no way of separating the two. Uh, and so um, it was a it was a non-starter, and I wasn't really able to do much in terms of Byzantine studies. But but I thought that was a really uh, interesting learning moment that uh, working with my Greek colleagues that the uh, Byzantium, uh, as you say, is coded. It has a certain meaning to it, uh, even if at the, at the surface level or from what people experience growing up. Nevertheless, there is this sense of Byzantium is connected to or even equated to something else. And in this case, it was uh, Orthodox Christianity. 
Um, but, and I think this is important to note, um, as you and I have been talking about this so far, as we understand it for our many friends out there who are in Turkey, uh, Byzantz has its own kind of coded meaning um, in, in Turkey, and, and this is certainly something that we can explore, but in Turkey, as far as we understand it, um, conservatives are likely to assume that um, an interest in Byzantium is um, e eccentric, uh, but it also perhaps betrays uh, the influence of Western um, cosmopolitan values, uh, or perhaps a dubious kind of uh, patriotism. So it's not that Byzantium in Turkey is coded on the right, but perhaps um, in, a, right. in a different way um, with, with wet, the West. Uh, and then that'll be something interesting to, to kind of explore a little bit. So, um, and, and, and just for our audience members, remember that there is the opportunity at the end of this to um, ask questions. And so uh, I would encourage you to, to do that uh, when, when the time comes by putting in the chat. Uh, your questions, and, and I, I would ask that you write them in English because I, I don't have access to Turkish myself, so uh, it would really help. Okay, so um, let's begin then sort of talking about Byzantium. Um, Anthony, you argue that Byzantium um, did not emerge as the dominant label for the Eastern Roman state and civilization until the later 19th century, which seems awfully late. Right. Uh, so, so what was it called or thought of before that? Okay, so we're not going to take a deep dive into medieval perceptions, but I think they're necessary to state in order to have the proper background. And in broad terms, down to about 800 AD, the Eastern Roman Empire um, was uh, understood and called to the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic, its uh, Respublica, right? Its emperors were called the emperors of the Romans or Roman emperors its subjects as the Romans and so forth in the West. So in Latin texts of the quote, early dark ages, right? Or the early middle ages. Um, so that changed pretty dramatically after the late eighth and ninth centuries um, when there was a almost universal switch in, West, in the West, in Western Europe to calling Byzantium the empire of the Greeks uh, and its emperor, the emperor of the Greeks. Um, this was not universal at first, and there were always exceptions to it down to even the 12th century, where occasionally you will find some Western power or diplomat referring to the emperor as the emperor of the Romans, or, or even to his subjects as the Romans. Usually that's in the context of someone asking the emperor for a favor, um, and so they were trying to be nice. But the Greek label and sort of rubric uh, took over and became dominant um, uh, during the Middle Ages. And this was um, an example of great power politics, but of the medieval period. So we're not going to be talking about it too much, but it very much reflected the interests and ideologies of, on the one hand, the papacy, which was creating its own kind of Roman identity um, and a, a sort of quasi-imperialistic view of its position in the Christian world. And on the other hand, of the German emperors, uh, who also took on the uh, title of Roman emperor. And they, they struggled mightily to <laughs> subsequently to understand what that meant. And I don't think they ever found an answer to why exactly they were calling themselves that. Uh, but that's the, 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 the point for us is that it precluded um, understanding the Eastern Empire as, as Roman. And so we have this uh, discourse um, and that is an entire discourse with you know, all of its historical and ethnic and ideological and religious implications um, of Greekness imposed um, on the um, Eastern Empire. And this lasted down to the 19th century, as we'll talk about. So, so you, you identify this kind of uh, separation almost of Greek and Roman uh, as, as a political and an intellectual process. And so that's really interesting. So, you know, when I think of Greece, of course, you know, I think of classical Greece um, and, 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 you know, the era of, of, of Athens and, and Pericles and the Parthenon and Greek drama. But one might also think of um, Alexander uh, of, of Macedon and, 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 and the conquest. And so um, as this kind of intellectual separation is, is taking place, let's say in the, in the ninth century moving forward, for the West, people in the West, what do they think of then when they think of Greeks, right? Because if they're calling 
the what was the Eastern Roman Empire, these people now they're identifying them as Greeks. Well, who are the Greeks and what is that legacy that they're, and, and how did they understand it? Sure. So this is an area that definitely requires more research. There hasn't been that much focused research on exactly what the Western discourse of, you know, medieval Greekness entails and how it links back to, um, you know, classical you know, uh, Greece, uh, as you mentioned. But generally, yes, this was understood to be a, a kind of ethnic continuity. So when Western writers and by this, I mean anybody writing down to the early 19th century. When they're referring to what we call Byzantium or the Byzantines as the Greeks, they definitely intend for these Greeks to be the descendants of the ancient Greeks. And in some cases to even have some of their qualities, uh, that is moral qualities. Now, obviously the language was a sort of given point of continuity. The, geograph you know, the general geographical location was also a given. And so on top of that, there were sort of ancient stereotypes that came from ancient Latin literature about the Greeks. Uh, you know, that they're, you know, overly sophisticated, perhaps a bit effeminate, you can't trust them too much. Um, so all of those kinds of negative um, stereotypes, uh, including some positive ones sometimes, right? Like that, that they are learned, right? That they have this body of literature and scholarship that sometimes people in the West did not have, that their philosophy was you know, very sophisticated. And so, so sometimes you get those positive ones as well. Um, so those tended to be um, projected onto uh, East Romans as well. And occasionally you do find discourses of continuity, um, ethnic continuity. So yes, this was pretty much an ethnic category that was used to write the history of you know, the, the Greeks, the Greek lands, the Greek peoples from antiquity down to the, the Middle Ages. And, uh, even into um, the Ottoman period. Um, so if, if you want to see a good example of this, by the way, so, so here, let's back up. Many people in the audience will have heard um, what is now becoming a kind of standard narrative, which is that the term Byzantium was invented by a German philologist, Hieronymus Wolf, in the 16th century, um, and that it, it became a kind of scholarly rubric after that. Um, and this is the narrative that I'm pushing against here. I don't think that happened. Um, I don't want to delve too much into the work of Wolf and how exactly the term Byzantium got caught up in it, um, but it wasn't his. It almost certainly was not his idea. It was his publishers, and it and he didn't take it from any, uh, you know, you know, scholarly investigation, but rather from a Greek work, which was Laonikos Kalkokonzilis, who was one of the, the you know historians of the fall in Greek. Um, who had just been translated into Latin and was using Byzantium to refer to Constantinople because he's writing about a period when Constantinople is pretty much all that was left of Byzantium. And so he was using the, the title. Um, that is the, the name of the city as the name of, for the state. Um, and the term Byzantium in early modern Europe usually just is a synonym for Constantinople. So instead of saying the empire of Constantinople, you would say the empire of Byzantium. Uh, a, a Byzantine history is a Constantinopolitan history. These things are used interchangeably, these terms. Um, so if you wanna see how this plays out, you can go look at Gibbon. Uh, Gibbon does not use the term Byzantium in the way that we do to refer to the, the whole empire, all of its subjects, its provinces, its civilization, its society, and so on. He uses the term Greek normally for that. Occasionally he will call them Romans, uh, like when they happen to win a battle or do something particularly Roman, he'll just say, ah, and they earned the name that they used for themselves. This, but otherwise it's Greek. Um, and this is, you know, in all of the writers of the, you know, the Enlightenment and so forth, it's, it's, it's Greek uh, pretty much all the way down. Uh, so, so that is the Western discourse. Um, I think it tracks down to the 19th century with a very few exceptions. I mean, some of them are interesting, uh, you know, Falmer Iyer, uh, obviously, but we'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the narrative and nobody bothered to really investigate, you know, how the Greeks of Pericles became the Greeks of, you know, Constantine the 11th, but, uh, you know, there were histories written of that. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're really pushing against this narrative that we have generally accepted that, you know, Wolf is responsible for kind of creating Byzantium. So, so that's something I think we should investigate, um, uh, further a little bit later, but I wanted to ask you this then, because there's so much imposition 
of uh, identification and, and name and, and even values and, and personality and characteristic, characteristic traits from the West upon those Greeks, um, you know, before and then, you know, during living in uh, the Ottoman Empire. So, so let's flip that around a little bit then. So what about the people who are having all of these labels imposed upon them? What did they, how did they think of themselves? And, and, and what did they call themselves? What did they call their land, their legacy? Um, so, so let's, you know, hear from their perspective, if, if, if you will. Yeah, so it largely depends on where you live and under whose power you live. Um, and, and so this is the key point in all of this history, that, that these labels are very political and they are determined by powerful interests, right? And so this is why I'm pushing against the, the Wolf narrative, which would like the, the term to be more of a philological origin, like scholars came up with this, when in fact it has much more to do uh, with empires and colonialism and, you know, generally, you know, how you understand and treat minorities and so on. Uh, so, so here's how these labels shake out in practice. If you're living under a Western power, so for example, Greek speaking Orthodox people in Italy. So this is in early modernity, you know, while the Ottoman Empire exists. If you're living in the West and most were in Italy, then you have to adopt to the persona of a Graikus, you know, because that's how you're understood and visible. That's how you become intelligible to a Western society. If you went to Italy and said you're a Roman, it would, first of all, mean something completely different and be understood fa as false. And if you try to explain it, it would be, oh, no, no, you mean, okay, you're Greek. Okay. So there were many um, Greeks in Italy um, and generally in the West. Also um, under Western colonial rule, for example, um, in, on Crete, right, under Venetian rule, the Venetians consistently referred to their subjects as Greci. Whenever we have access to those subjects' own writings, they refer to themselves as Romans, Romae, uh, usually. I mean, occasionally the term Grecos is used uh, to refer to language. But the majority of the people we're talking about are living in the Ottoman Empire. And in the Ottoman Empire, um, they, they are under no constraint to change who they are. Um, and this is actually one of the main dynamics that... Um, kind of facilitated the incorporation of Byzantine, right? East Roman populations into the Roman Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire, is that the Ottomans didn't require them to change their religion, uh, which Westerners did to Catholicism, and they didn't require them to change their ethnic label to something else, uh, Greek in the West. So in the Ottoman Empire, they remained Orthodox Romans. And were called that, understood that, right, as the, the term that um, Arabs and then Turks had used for uh, the East Romans uh, ever since the seventh century, which was Rum, uh, Romans. Um, and this was pretty fully an ethnic label. Um, now, there's a lot of confusion about this, uh, about this term, especially in, in Ottoman usage and in the Ottoman administration. Um, so let me make a kind of distinction here. The there is a kind of political Roman identity that we have, especially in antiquity. Um, so there are periods um, uh, of the history of the Roman Empire when being Roman is largely a function of being a, a, a citizen of the state, of having Roman citizenship, um, even if you're um, like in the uh, what we call the early Byzantine period, your language might be, you know, Coptic or Aramaic or Thracian or Celtic or whatever, but you're, you're part of a broader Roman commonwealth. Um, so in, in those periods, Roman identity is the political and legal that has a kind of multi-ethnic or multicultural uh, uh, realities on the ground. But at, in the middle and late Byzantine periods, Roman identity becomes more tightly ethnic in that it refers to a very specific population that is Greek speaking and Orthodox by its own lights, so Chalcedonian Christianity. Um, and, you know, they have particular customs and dress and food and all of that. Um, and our texts are pretty consistent in identifying that population and ethnic lines. So the subjects of the emperor might be Romans, Armenians, Vlachs, you know, whatever. So this is an ethnic category. When the Roman state is abolished, that population remained. 
um, it was just now cut loose from its sort of institutional framework and became yet one of the many uh, ethnic groups or ethno-religious groups living in the Ottoman Empire. And they retained both of those identities as Orthodox and Roman. And so in the Ottoman Empire, um, you've, you all, the texts are pretty consistent that Romans are an ethnic category alongside, you know, Albanians, Serbs, Bulgarians, Vlachs, however, you know, however you, wherever you are, depending on the groups that are there. Um, and so after the fall of Byzantium, um, the Romans become an, an, mostly an ethnic group uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And um, so, so this is a dual perspective, as you said, uh, among themselves and in the eyes of the Ottoman authorities uh, or Muslim authorities, they are Rum, um, <clears throat> but in the West, they are or have to be Greeks. Uh, and so this is the kind of duality that exists as we move toward the 19th century. At some point then, you know, the West is calling them Greeks. They understand themselves to be Romans. But at some point, the, the Greekness as a marker of identity um, supersedes the, the Romanness. When and how does that happen? Right, so this is a process that takes place in a number of different places uh, at, at a different speed, right? So if we're looking, if we're positioning ourselves around, you know, the mid 18th century and we ask, okay, where are the Greeks? Well, you're gonna find there's people who have a Greek identity uh, living in the West. So they are Greek minorities uh, in Italy, but in, in many countries by that point. Um, and <clears throat> under, uh, we know by that point, there are almost no Western sort of colonies left in uh, the Greek world. Uh, the, the Ionian islands, for example, never, you know, came under Ottoman rule. Um, <clears throat> so in those areas, you do begin to get a, a discourse, an emic discourse of Greekness that is uh, produced by the people themselves. And in some cases, they even um, double down on it in the sense that they embrace it, especially as, you know, in the aftermath of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, Greek things, ancient Greek things, this is important, ancient Greek things come uh, into, become prestigious in the West. And so identifying yourself with that narrative is advantageous, is socially advantageous. So you begin to get self-realized Greek intellectuals uh, working in the West. The most famous of these uh, late 18th, early 19th century is Adamandios Corais, who's working in Paris. Um, and, and he has, but there are others, but he most famously developed this idea of, you know, ideas of Greek identity uh, that, that, by the way, were very overtly anti-Byzantine. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that later. Um, so, so that was one um, uh, source. Um, but that generally didn't happen in the Ottoman Empire itself. Um, it, or it happened much slower and much later. But some of the ground for it had been laid uh, by the time of the Greek Revolution. So, so what I'm hearing is that um, for someone like Korais, who's in the West and, and you know, sort of in the circles of, of Western intellectuals, that there was almost a, um, an advantage to playing up that connection uh, particularly to the classical past uh, as a way to elevate his own prestige, but perhaps the prestige of other Greeks like him. Whereas in the East or further East under Ottoman rule, um, it, it's a much slower process, right? Because there isn't this kind of desire to elevate prestige at a social, intellectual, cultural level. Um, but, but that nevertheless, the groundwork is laid there for the Greekness to kind of come forth, right? Is that... Um... Yeah, but it's much more difficult to do in the Ottoman Empire, um, in large part because of the role of the church. Um, now, so the, the, the Byzantine church is sort of traditionally um, hostile to ideas of Hellenic identity. Now, th th this is in this is in part a semantic confusion, in part actual substantive reasons to resist it. The semantic confusion is that in, in Greek and um, the Greek church, uh, paganism writ large, any aspect of paganism uh, was literally called Hellenism, like that's what it was called. Um, and so any idea of trying to 
fashion a narrative of Greek ethnic identity, historical continuity or whatever, would run into this resistance or suspicion that it's somehow anti-Orthodox, that you're trying to bring back pagan things. And we settled that a long time ago. And right. So um, it, 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 it's seen as suspect as being too close to pagan antiquity. So that's one kind of problem. Uh, the other is that by the late but by the late 18th century is, is when we have the, the sort of more classical form of uh, an institution of the Ottoman Empire that's known as the Millet system. Now, we don't want to get into the details of it, its institutional history. Uh, there's been a lot of confusion about this, um, and it, it has the following, it takes the following shape. There was a, dis a discourse emerged that was linked to the Millet system, which identified as room uh, anyone who was a member of the Greek Orthodox Church or the Orthodox Church of Constantinople, the Chalcedonian Orthodox Church of Constantinople. <laughs> um, remember, all Christian groups consider themselves Orthodox. In this. And so um, that's, that's the group I refer to when I'm saying Orthodox for simplicity's sake. And so... By that point, you begin to have this, this overarching uh, Orthodox administration that tended to group together people of different ethnic groups uh, under the label of Rum, uh, like Bulgarians, for example, or some blocks or you know, whatever. And so you begin to have this semantic confusion where Rum was the sort of, I don't know if dominant, socially more prestigious, perhaps wealthier element of that group. But then there were others that were grouped with them into this, uh, the, the, the organization of the patriarchy. Now, by the way, um, this idea of the Millet of Rome as being this overarching multi-ethnic organization, um, which is indicative of the later phases of the Ottoman Empire, um, this is being used for example, today in the 20th century and today by let's say neo-Orthodox groups uh, uh, active in Greece and elsewhere, where they, 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 what they try to do is they run together Romanness and Orthodoxy uh, and kind of say, well, these are the same thing. Romanness is this multi-ethnic category and they point to the late Ottoman system uh, as being indicative of it. And they're generally suspicious of the nation states. They believe that nation states are kind of antithetical to ecumenical orthodoxy. Um, and you know that's fine. That's that's their position. Um, it, it's not you know our job to to um, uh, you know to question their values or priorities or anything like that. But we have to be very careful not to assume that that's how Byzantium itself right operated. This is not indicative of Byzantium. This is a late Ottoman. Uh, way of categorizing people. Uh, if you look at Byzantium, you will generally not find, uh, in fact, it's extremely difficult to find, ideas of Romanness that are multi-ethnic in this sense. Um, Romanness is, is very et tied to one specific ethnic group. Um, and so um, the, uh, anyway, so that was a parenthesis about a kind of ecumenical patriarchal view of Roman identity. Um, now, this all began to collapse in the 19th century. Um, so, so, so um, yeah, it's interesting. You, you kind of describe a lot of simmering going on here. You know that, yes. that these developments have been cooking for for quite some time. So, so let's take it to the 19th century then, um, and and the Greek War of Independence. Uh, it, it really kind of changed dynamics, sense of relationship, obviously with Greek speakers living in the Ottoman Empire, with the Ottoman Empire, and then of course the Western great powers where all of these kinds of developments are, are sort of now bubbling over, right? Because we've been simmering for a long time and now we're, we're bubbling over. So um, what were the main changes then that resulted in this uh, from 1821 moving forward, or you know, perhaps even the lead up to 1821 and afterward? Um, how how did the this this change the relationship and particularly you know uh, Byzantium you know we we we've been kind of dancing around it and now we can bring it back to the conversation but um, all of these dynamics are taking place um, in the early nineteenth century moving forward so so what's changing at this time yeah so the Greek Revolution or the War of Independence it really changed all of these dynamics pretty fundamentally and very quickly 
Um, so let's just take them in turn. Uh, the, so for one thing, it caused a major shift in perceptions of identity within the new Greek state. So most of the population would have identified either as, as Roman Orthodox or Albanian, um, Arvanites, so there were also, you know, some Muslims involved um, uh, and other groups. Uh, but the organizing ideology of the revolution, especially as projected toward the West, was Greek. And this is crucial because the leaders of the revolution knew from the beginning, they were explicit about this, that without Western support or at least Western consent, this was not going to work. Um, and actually that they were right, it turned out that militarily the war was a failure until Western powers intervened um, and bailed it out. So this, this was understood and correctly understood. Um, and probably the main argument that the leaders of the revolution could make to the West for that support was that, you know, look, we are the descendants of the ancient Greek. You love the Greeks, right? We're Greeks. You know, we're, we're Christian Greeks, even better. We're trying to overthrow, right, the, the yoke of, of Turkish tyranny. So help us out here. And the narrative of revived Hellenism was extremely powerful. Okay, this has been studied so many, many times. Um, and it caused a shift um, in the perceptions of identity locally within the new Greek state. Um, and for a while, this resulted in a kind of dual identity of being both Greek and Roman. Um, and this has been studied, uh, so this lasts for about a century, uh, where these two categories kind of overlap, or rather they kind of complement each other, uh, sort of in different existential sites. So there are ways in which these people are Greek, you know, talk about national narratives and antiquity and the, the whole classical prestige and, you know, we like our monuments and all that. But, you know, if you go, you know, visit them at home and see how they live, well, they go to little Orthodox chapels and, you know, they have Roman, right, uh, ethnic um, attributes uh, written all over them. Uh, but in time, the uh, Greek uh, uh, discourse of identity prevails. Um, it is completely dominant um, in, in Greece today, for example. I mean, you call yourself a Romios. By this point, it's, it's beyond quaint. I think by this point, you won't even be understood or you will be understood to be from Constantinople, like, yeah, like you're, you're part of the, the room minority um, in, in either the Ottoman Empire or, or Turkey. Um, so it, it causes a shift um, in identity there. Now, this has knock-on effects uh, throughout the system, right? So for example, think now of Orthodox Romans in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. So they're now in a tricky situation because there is... Uh, a kind of ethnic slash national state that claims to speak for you. Because the, the Greek state from its inception was understood to be not only revolutionary, but irredentist. That is to free other Greeks or, Rome, or Orthodox people, right? Um, and so it poses a very real danger to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it, it expands over the 19th century. It claims more territories in the early 20th century. It, takes, you know, Macedonia and Thessaloniki and so forth. Um, so it now creates the problem of dual loyalties among the, uh, the Orthodox populations of the Ottoman Empire on the one hand. And on the other hand, it causes rifts within the world of the patriarchate. This is probably the most important one because the patriarchate now has to take a position that's very, that has to be very carefully calibrated like we are, yes, we're Greek speaking, Roman Orthodox, but we're, we don't ally with, right, the state of Greece. We, we don't, we're not their representatives, we're not the fifth column, we're nothing like that. But within the world of the patriarchate, Greek speakers tend to be dominant. And so now other groups, the most important case being the Bulgarians, begin to think, wait a minute, the patriarchate is just a Greek institution and we're second class citizens within it. Um, and this becomes increasingly apparent during the 19th century. So why isn't there equality among all the different, right, uh, uh, ethnic groups of the patriarchate? Um, and this, of course, ultimately leads or contributes to uh, Bulgarian independence. Um, now, in the, in the West, this also has alarming consequences. So Western powers 
So the people in charge of them, you know, Britain, France, even the U.S. and so on. Well, the U.S. is pretty removed, but many Americans, uh, you know, went to the and fought in the War of uh, Independence. The great powers are very concerned because you know, the one thing they all agree in uh, agree on uh, is that they don't want to encourage or allow independence movements because this could jeopardize all of them, right? Uh, they all had a stake in maintaining the status quo. Uh, this is, you know, uh, probably a, you know, a single sentence summary of the 19th century. <laughs> How do we maintain the status quo? And this meant also including uh, protecting the Ottoman Empire, right? So everybody keeps uh, the status quo because we don't want any one of our rivals to get an advantage here. Anyway, but now you have an independent Greek state that is projecting a Greek identity, right? Very powerfully appealing to your own citizens, right? In the West. And it, one of its goals is to liberate other Greeks, right? So this poses a real problem. Um, and it all comes to a head later in the 19th century uh, within a few decades. Yeah, you know, so, so it's, I'm thinking about this because I've, I've been reading a little bit about what, um, what was happening in America, for example. Um, and then this, this desire to maintain a kind of a, a fragile equilibrium um, but, but particularly driven, I think, by economic interests, right? I mean, um, if something falls apart, then, as you said, the great powers felt like there was a, a real threat here. But in the U.S. is interesting because um, officially the government, um, through the Monroe Doctrine, you know, maintained a position of, of non-intervention. Uh, but on the other hand, you had like almost like a, you know, grassroots movement of people yeah. who were... Um, we might call them Philhellenes, right? Who wanted to support yeah. this revolution uh, and, and the freedom of these people. And, and it's interesting because then there are these values that they're highlighting of, of democracy that traces back to Pericles and Athens. But at the same time, there's also this Christianity that becomes a part of the formula as well that, you know, these are Christians um, rising up against um, they're, they're Muslim rulers. And so there's this, this constant uh, tension that the, uh, the, war, uh, the, the war of independence has really kind of uh, um, led to almost this, uh, I don't know if it's quite contradictory, but nevertheless, don't intervene, but support. Yes. Trying to do this. Um, oh. Were the Western powers, the great powers, were, were they successful in doing this, do you think? It, it was a huge problem. It's, it's bigger even than is normally acknowledged. So for example, um, Muslim subjects of the Western empires took note. So for example, in British India, uh, where you have intellectuals say, wait a minute, you're willing to allow the Christian subjects of a Muslim empire to rebel and have their own independent state. What about us, the Muslim subjects of a Christian empire? So, you know, so Greece posed this kind of problem in a very stark way. And here's where it all comes together with the term Byzantium, that this new, newly created revolutionary and potentially expansionist Greek state is Greek and is, at, is beginning to appeal to Byzantine precedent in order to claim territories. And there were many Greek sort of intellectuals and sort of proto-nationalists who wanted to revive essentially the Byzantine Empire as a Greek empire, as a Greek Christian empire. Um, and this discourse is woven very tightly into the, the um, uh, discourse of, the, of the, the ideology of the revolution as well. So on the one hand, you have the appeal to ancient Greece and Pericles and the classics. And on the other hand, you have the you know, historically fairly recent precedent of a Greek empire in precisely the territories that the Greek state wants to reacquire. And so now suddenly this thousand year long Western discourse about the empire of the Greeks becomes very problematic. And, and it's, it's during the 19th century that it's quietly retired. But there's one more factor uh, that we need to mention before we finally retire the empire of the Greeks and get Byzantium, and that is Russia. Yeah, I was going to say, um, we've been talking about the great powers and primarily our focus has been on, you know, Western continental Europe, right, and, and, and sort of the imperialist ventures and, and things that they had been doing, but they're, the big, the bear, right, is, is there. And, and in fact, there were a lot of Greeks during the revolution who, 
or counting on, on Russian intervention and support. So tell us about the other great power of Russia and what, what role they're playing, um, both in the sort of political unraveling of the um, revolution, but then also this kind of intellectual conceptualization of, of who these Greeks are, both sort of in the Greek mainland, but also living in, in under uh, Ottoman rule. Yeah, so Russia played a decisive role in the success of the Greek Revolution. The interventions were absolutely crucial, probably the single most important uh, set of interventions. Um, now, um, here's where it gets interesting. So the Russian connection to Greece was primarily along the lines of orthodoxy. Right? So this was the angle that the Tsars were using to intervene in the Balkans or um, in, in any Ottoman you know, land, um, and not along the lines of like Philhellenism and the classical tradition so much. Now, obviously these aren't absolute categories, but for the most part, you know, uh, the Greeks derive support in the West because of the classical tradition and the appeal to Hellenism and support from Russia because of their, their common orthodoxy, right? And these two strands began to diverge in the 19th century. So Russian interests here, so Russia had had longstanding interest in, you know, re regaining Tsargrad, you know, Constantinople. Um, there had been plans for reviving the Greek empire as an Orthodox empire under, you know, Russian tutelage. Um, and all of these developments came to a head in the Crimean War. Um, and this is kind of why I believe that the Crimean War was the primary crucible for the creation of the category Byzantium. Now, most people, okay, this is, might sound like an unusual claim. You better unpack that a bit. <laughs> what is the Crimean War? Okay, um, so I'm not going to get into detailed uh, history of it, but this is in the 1850s. And, and it is a war between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, mostly in the Crimea, not entirely. Um, and it is a war in which Britain and France came to the aid of the Ottoman Empire against what they perceived as Russian aggression. And it was a, it was a brutal, bloody war uh, in the Crimea. It, it really shocked contemporaries. Um, and it stemmed in, in part from the, the Tsar's um, idea that they were the patrons of Christians in the Ottoman Empire and their attempts to intervene in it. Uh, so it's very much in line with Russian policy. Uh, the Russians lost the war, by the way, pretty badly. Uh, but here's the interesting part. Greece, yeah, sided with the Tsar. Now, not so much officially, uh, but basically the, the king kind of like, I'm not listening, I'm not, you know, you, do whatever. And his subjects and including even some of his army officers sort of uh, retired their commissions in order to go fight as private citizens on behalf of Russia. And so there were some military units that, that tried to expand out of the uh, territories of the Greek state at that time uh, against the Ottoman Empire in what would today be sort of central Greece and, and a little bit in the north, uh, in northern Greece. And so Greece allied itself with Russia, at least this was how it was perceived, and even worse, recruited the discourse of the empire of the Greeks in order to justify what they were doing. So the whole discourse of, you know, this medieval Greek empire um, came back to haunt the West when Greece was now setting about to recreate it. And in fact, the, the key slogan of the Greek uh, participation in the Crimean War was, Greek empire or death, right? So the newspapers were publishing this, uh, pamphlets all over the place. And, and some of the leaders of the war effort were the sons of the, the leaders of the revolution. And so this alarmed Britain and France uh, immensely. And in fact, they occupied the Piraeus and Athens with gunships um, and they confiscated the printing presses. So newspapers in Athens had their printing presses confiscated because this Greek empire business was understood to be, you know, well, treasonous to the Western war effort. So, and Greece was supposed to be a nominal ally. So it wasn't supposed to be siding with Russia. And here's the other problem. 
Um, Greece was suspected of being a Russian pawn at this time. So this idea of retaking Constantinople and recreating the Greek empire was less a problem of, you know, what those pesky little Greeks might do on their own, but that in fact, they're a proxy for the Russian empire. And so any attempts at Greek empire are just basically extending the power of Russia. Uh, this was a widespread perception in the 19th century. In fact, I even found, because you mentioned the US, I found a column written by that greatest journalist of the 19th century, Karl Marx. <laughs> yes, he wrote newspaper columns in, and published them in American newspapers explaining to Americans, no, 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 this isn't your noble Greek revolutionary who's trying to throw off the Turkish yoke and whatever. He's just being duped by the Russians. Uh, you know, Marx was actually very anti-Russian. <laughs> you know, anyway, that's a, uh, one of those other ironies of history. Um, and so the, the idea was that empire of the Greeks was basically a vehicle for Russian imperialism. And that's when we find in the later 19th century, the term empire of the Greeks, Greek empire, and so forth is gradually retired. Um, now, this is, as far as I can tell, this is done quietly. In other words, the term became very toxic after the 1850s in the war of Crimea. I have found some, some, some people who discuss this as like, well, this war and the concept of the empire of the Greeks are kind of interlinked and it's kind of problematic. The Greeks don't know what they're doing. Um, but in the uptick in historical scholarship in the later 19th century, that is, as the field begins to come together as an academic discipline, we, it, it happens precisely in a period when empire of the Greeks declines as a term. Uh, you can do some interesting uh, Google uh, uh, you know, searches in, in books uh, which show you how those terms decline and how Byzantium picks up at exactly the same time, um, actually kind of later in the 19th century. So Byzantium comes in as this neutral term for describing the entire civilization, not just Constantinople, in order to not call it Greek, largely. I'm now simplifying here, but that's the main trend. And if you want to see how this plays out in practice, like in a in an institutional prog programmatic statement, um, you can, I refer you to the preface to the first volume of Byzantinische Zeitschrift written by Karl Krumbacher, 1892, where in explaining what this field of Byzantine studies is, um, and it, he defines it in some pretty strange ways in ways that look strange to us, right? Um, he very explicitly distances the field from Greece, uh, that this is not, a, a, a intended to be a Greek dominated field. It's nothing to do with the Greeks. It's just the language of most of the texts is in Greek. Um, but he was all, actually fending off a proposal made to him by a very prominent Greek scholar, uh, Spiridon Lambros, uh, who, who, who's a first rate scholar um, from you know, 100 years ago, who, who said, well, we should set up this journal of Byzantine studies in Greece and I'll get some royal uh, sponsorship and, and endowments for it. Uh, Lambros was very close with the monarchy. Um, and it makes perfect sense. Like this is the natural country to have such a journal in because he was operating in the rubric of, you know, Greek continuity and the empire of the Greeks and so on. And Krumbacher explicitly wanted to distance the new field from that whole conception. And so Byzantine is this abstract term um, kind of empty of content, like empty of ethnic content for sure, right? So, so we stopped talking about the Greeks and now we talk about the Byzantines. So if you realize this, uh, the, the Byzantines is an empty term. Um, it doesn't really signify anybody. It is anybody living in the empire. I mean, that's, I mean, you don't encounter that kind of concept in Byzantine texts. Um, so that transition is pretty much complete by the early 20th century. Uh, Empire of the Greeks was a toxic term and was retired and we don't really use it. Um, and this was done not because a better, more accurate term was found, no, because the aversion to calling it Roman from the Middle Ages, this was like built into the DNA of Western perceptions of Byzantium was still there, like that didn't go away. 
So you can't call it Roman. You don't really want to call it Greek. And so Byzantine emerged as this kind of safe term. That's it's a so Byzantine is a safe term that makes Western imperial powers of the 19th and 12th, early 20th century feel more comfortable. Uh, that's that's largely its function. Um, the, the question we have to ask ourselves is whether, you know, we need to continue those those politics uh, of, of the term. Does this term really represent where we want our research to be? Uh, but there are also a few ironies here in that, you know, Greek national scholarship actually was one of the few to continue the old, you know, Greek rubric. And so in the 19th century, you have Greek um, uh, historians, Papadopoulos and others, who tried to, you know, they, they took the model of the Greeks from Western historiography and continued it and tried to create this unified history of the Greeks from antiquity to the present. Um, the, the, and, you know, so ironically, the last place where that medieval Western category survives is in the more sort of nationalist, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, type of uh, uh, Greek historiography. Um, interestingly, also, like if you consider the situation in Turkey, uh, where you see that Byzantium, in a way, you know, though it's obviously tainted even today by association with with Greece and the and the Greeks and and Orthodoxy and so forth, it it was easier to use Byzantine. Uh, so it kind of facilitated. Uh, you know, Turkish engagement uh, to some degree with that because it's this kind of neutral term uh, in the context of 19th century politics. <laughs> so this term Byzantium or Byzantine is this almost like an empty shell um, that, as you say, um, is safe enough for the, especially these Western intellectuals to use without the baggage of Greek empire and this kind of thing. And so in a lot of ways, this is a just it's a, it's a construct, it's made up. Um, and yet at the same time, um, you know, you and I are sitting here and we probably identify as scholars of Byzantine studies and we go to uh, conferences on, on Byzantine studies. And so, uh, and, and of course you've written um, things where Byzantium, I'm sure if I opened up your indexes, indices would, 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 would be there. And so, um, you know, why continue using this, empty shell uh, or this kind of 19th century construct, um, why, why still use it? Is, it? is it still valuable or is it still convey a certain meaning? Uh, and, and you know, you as a scholar of this field, what does it mean for you? Well, that's the hardest question. And in, <laughs> yeah, in fact, just a few weeks ago, um, I realized that I'm now part of a a discussion group online organized by George Demacopoulos at Fordham University. And we're actually going to discuss that very question. Um, so I encourage everybody who wants to see a, a panel, actually, it's not just myself. Um, I, I agreed to be on it for obvious reasons. We're going to engage precisely with that question. Like, what do we do now? Um, and so, you know, that'll be a fuller discussion of that issue. Uh, for the moment, I so I'll just say two things and then we can wrap up and, and go to questions because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that our audience will have lots of questions about all of this. Um, so for the moment, there's a practical issue that is, there is this field, it is institutionally incorporated as Byzantine studies, all of its instruments and, and uh, you know, organs are, you know, uh, uh, tied to that name. There, there are obviously popular perceptions, but it's not as if you can step away from the name. Um, so my uh, focus has been not so much on the name. I, I generally am not a, afraid of labels at this point, um, but more on the actual content, the substance, like what exactly are we talking about? Um, can we agree on the, on the substance, even if we place it under this rubric for the sake of convention or whatever? In other words, I can imagine a situation where Byzantine is sort of rehabilitated as a, as a phase in the history of the Roman polity, as a phase in the history of Greek literature, as a phase in the history of Christianity, so long as we understand uh, how that works out, you know, in each of those domains. 
Um, so my, my interest is in understanding the historical reality of this society, less so worrying about the terms. However, I will say that while I'm not only open, but I feel sort of that it's necessary to still use the term Byzantium in some way, say, on, in book titles, because you're identifying the field that you're addressing. If you don't use it, you, you, you're setting yourself perhaps outside of the conversation, and I don't want to be outside the conversation. The conversation is precisely about this. But inside the books, like in the content, I find it impossible to use terms such as the Byzantines because they're meaningless. Like that doesn't signify any, or it signify it's too vague and confusing to actually represent the lived reality at, at, any, at any point. Um, so I think we have to have this conversation about where it's useful, where it's not. But I'll say this in closing, that I have found colleagues in all other fields that they're generally very willing to um, accommodate a, a change in how our field understands itself. I don't see any pushback coming from ancient Roman historians. I mean, if you, if you look at what they're writing about Roman identity, they, they seem to be quite open to the possibility of it flexibly mutating into the form that we see in Byzantium. Um, there might be some pushback from Western medieval historians. They're, they're probably the only ones who are more invested in that, in that kind of um, discourse. But I'll say this, that, that certainly the, the biggest resistance to change within the field will come from scholars within the field. I mean, especially those who are trained in the discourse of Byzantine studies and who, you know, perhaps have a... a, a long career of publishing under that rubric as if it means something. Um, also, who have participated in the denial of Byzantium's Roman identity or its marginalization, there's going to be pushback. Um, uh, I look forward to seeing what kinds of arguments it can make. Uh, so in conclusion, I'm not so um, concerned about the label as I am that we understand what we're talking about in substantive terms, and then we can worry about what labels are appropriate for that. Well, and I think you ultimately illustrate the, you know, the importance of a field of study um, changing over time and, 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 and asking itself these kinds of questions. I mean, we would never want our intellectual endeavors to be static. I mean, we, we want to, to, to push the boundaries. And I think these, uh, issues that you've raised over the, the last hour really, I think, do that. They provoke um, further questions, right? And I think that's what good scholarship does, is it, that it uh, doesn't say, here it is, accept it, right? But it says, um, here are the, the problems, here are the developments, here are the questions. Let's move forward from here. And we might not agree along the way, but I think that's part of the the joy of, of what we do. And so I really appreciate your unpacking this over the last hour. Um, so, so there have been a lot of questions that have come up in the chat, and so I'm going to do my best to, um, in the time that we have, about uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, to, to unpack some of these uh, and, and see if you uh, might respond to them. So um, one of the first questions that came in uh, is, is from a theologian, so someone who works on uh, Middle Byzantine liturgy in particular, and um, the question kind of ask this, you know, the synonymity of Byzantine, Byzantium and orthodoxy, you know, is it so entrenched that, you know, that it just cannot be separated, especially for, for those who are immersed in the orthodox tradition? Or is, is there a way that even within it, uh, particularly from a theological perspective, for those who are interested in theology and liturgy, you know, can um, someone immersed in these interests still rightly critique and, and, and probe and, and, and explore Byzantine studies or Byzantine history from that point of view. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Yes, yes. And the answer is yes, absolutely. I don't see any, any serious obstacle here uh, or, or problem. Now, let me just say that, I mean, orthodoxy is a huge fundamental component uh, even template for a great deal of Byzantine civilization. I don't mean to sort of uh, 
marginalize it at all. Um, so no, no, it's it's crucial. In fact, necessary to understand pretty much everything going on in any other domain. Yeah. Um, but there are, uh, again, historical reasons for these associations, right? So, I, I mean, think about it this way. Um, 20th century scholarship on Byzantium, what we normally consider as being, you know, Byzantine scholarship proper is, I, I'd say, sort of tends to focus on orthodoxy more than the other acknowledged constitutive um, uh, dimensions of Byzantine civilization, right? So simply to point to Ostrogorsky's famous definition that Byzantium is of this mix of Roman, Greek, and Orthodox elements, it's pretty clear that when we're understand that in the 20th century, you know, when we talk about Byzantine identity or ideology or anything, it's overwhelmingly about orthodoxy. Now that needs to be fixed a little bit, but we can now realize why that's the case. There's a long tradition of denying the Roman aspects. And in the 20th century, it was kind of difficult to talk about the Greek ones. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the, in the opening, uh, in part because of the association with Greek nationalism and, and all of this. So it's kind of awkward to talk about it. Uh, but I think that we can easily find ways to talk about these things without raising, you know, 19th century, 20th century um, entanglements. And um, I don't see any problem for studies of Byzantium that come, you know, from within the world of orthodoxy because they come from Byzantium as well. Um, and I think also that, you know, seeing Byzantium as a, as a more, uh, as a richer society in a way where orthodoxy is not like the undisputed or uh, sole um, cultural force that it had to contend with other things too, right? And, and in, in, in many aspects of Byzantine history are, you know, people who are within the sort of, let's say who specialize in orthodox matters, be they bishops or patriarchs or monks or, you know, this, this sort of thing, saints, uh, coming into uh, tension with uh, in individuals or groups who express other uh, interests, uh, you know, Roman military, Roman law, the administration, Hellenic learning. Uh, it's much more, I see it as a field of tensions and they're very culturally productive tensions rather than this kind of orthodox monolith. And I think that seeing Byzantine orthodoxy as part of a network of cultural tensions is actually more productive for understanding Byzantine orthodoxy itself. Mm. Uh, so I would definitely welcome those kinds of approaches. Yeah, that, that's a really great conceptualization. A network of, what do you say, network of... It's a network of tensions and they're very culturally productive. Yeah, yeah, because that can then, you can read liturgy and you can read uh, sermons and, and, and theology and, and really kind of have these different avenues of exploration. I think that's really helpful to think of it in that way. Um, so, so I'm always struck by this constant sort of um, binary that we, we speak of West and East. Uh, West being continental Europe, East being Greece and, and the Ottomans. But if we think about it, um, there is a further East, uh, you know, this kind of the, the world of, the, uh, of, of the, the Arabic world and the caliphates in earlier times and, and, and of, of the course of Islam. And so um, from the perspective of the further East, um, Byzantium uh, is the middle, right? Um, you have the West and the middle, and then you have the further East. So I, I wonder in, in your own research, uh, and this is kind of tied to a question, what about the perspective from that further East part um, looking at Constantinople and Byzantium? I mean, is there something to be drawn from there? Is something fruitful from that perspective? Oh, absolutely, though. Um, I'm not sure that um, I'm, I'm not sure that people understood themselves as being like in the East or in the West yeah. of like yeah. of whom, right? Yeah. Um, with, with one interesting exception, uh, actually just yesterday, it occurred to me that the title used by the last emperors of Trebizond, so, you know, late Byzantine period was, so they made this deal with the Paleologi and they didn't call themselves uh, emperors of the Romans, but emperors of all the East. <laughs> the emperors of Trebizond and the East, but East in relation to what? Yeah, it's yeah. clearly in Constantinople, right? Which it's one of these weird cases. Anyway, um, so you're exactly right. Uh, Eastern perspectives are crucial 
Um, and let me just add what a wonderful vantage point Byzantium is, like the study of Byzantium and that, that whole millennium for understanding both sides, right? Like both Western Europe, but also what was going on uh, in, in the Islamic world. Uh, because it, it, it really does look both ways. Um, and you have multiple interactions uh, taking place, you know, between the, the Romans and, and Christians in the, in, the, in the caliphate and its successors. Uh, and, and these are actually, in some respects, also very constitutive of Byzantine culture itself, right? So especially in the, what we generally call the period of iconoclasm, a great deal of Byzantine culture, um, like in Constantinople, Constantinopolitan culture was influenced and shaped uh, by, uh, you know, uh, people who were leaving from like, Palestine and Syria and coming to Constantinople. Um, and, but also with interactions with Arabic learning and Arabic culture. Um, and uh, anyway, so as a Byzantinist, I feel very privileged that I not only have to, but I want to look in both directions. And it gives me a much broader picture of the medieval world um, than, um, than what you see um, a lot of scholarship that is like Western medieval focused, you know, France and England, and, you know, that's the medieval world. Um, but like, so... I'm wondering if you were thinking, were you reading a question by an audience member or? Well, it, it was someone recognizing that those in the, the Far East, as we might call it, um, that they knew that the people living in Constantinople were Romans, you know, and they called them as such. And so, oh, yeah, yeah. In the, in there the... seems to be a lot more to be drawn from that region to help us understand more deeply our, our own field, you know, and I think that's... Uh, Right, because they had no um, interest in denying it. Like there was no institutional pressure to, to, to deny it. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that continued in use uh, all the way down to early modern times. Yeah. yeah. So, so you mentioned uh, George Dimkopoulos um, and, and there's a question here that I think um, ties in nicely with a book he recently published on the Fourth Crusade, where there's this question of um, Byzantine studies as uh, uh, colonized. You know, that and in a lot of ways, as we've been sort of talking about a lot of imposition, right, of West to this people in this area and the culture. So um, can we say that Byzantine studies itself is a kind of colonial venture? Uh, and if so, um, is there a way or do you think of um, decolonizing? Uh, maybe your work, do you think of it as decolonizing? Um, or are these categories that, that aren't operative for you in your own thinking? No, I think they're relevant. Uh, so let me just say that the question of decolonizing Byzantine studies um, is, is coming up increasingly more often. Um, and there is a volume being put together by Mirela Ivanova and Ben Anderson with, I think, precisely that title. Uh, it consists of very short uh, you know, interventions. Um, I, I contributed one. I, I'm not sure what stage the, the book is at, but um, they are definitely the people who have pulled together all the different uh, understandings of what that process might look like. Um, so, you know, they definitely have a broader perspective than I do uh, on all the different ways in which one can understand Byzantium, Byzantine studies rather, as being a, a, a colonized discipline. I definitely think it's appropriate to some degree um, in, at least insofar as uh, w w there are Western paradigms that is that come from that millennium of polemical, you know, distortion that need to be um, um, discarded, um, you know, understood in their own historical context, but not used by us. Um, and there are some pretty deep colonial implications to what uh, the Latins or the Franks were doing in the Aegean after the 13th century. Uh, as George explains, uh, he lays out some of these aspects. There are many, many more. Um, and we might also want to interrogate the reluctance of crusade scholarship in engaging with uh, the question of colonialism. They're generally very allergic to that. Um, uh, anyway, uh, but uh, yes, now, you know, I, I just want to point out to the audience that there are all kinds of other aspects to decolonizing that have to do with institutional power and prestige and inequality and resources and who speaks for whom today, right? And 
so our our you know Western scholars in uh, you know wealthy institutions authorized to speak for small group X in whatever land like th- like yes those are all legitimate questions uh, and uh, we should all try to face them insofar as we are engaged in that kind of scholarship mm. yeah yeah it's, it's great I, and again I think. Um, these are the kinds of questions that we need to be asking, right? To, to move our, propel our field forward. Um, to shift gears a little bit, there's a question that came in about um, the late 19th and early 20th century, in particular, um, Turkish nationalism. Um, so uh, this sort of Byzantium as a concept, um, what effect or what role did it play in, in sort of the, the Turkish uh, sort of uh, discovery of South, let's say, coming out of, um, you know, certainly out of the Ottoman period. But is, is there a role to be played by Byzantium in, in that um, narrative and discourse? There might be. Um, I'm not an expert on that. Let me just say that uh, Greek, so modern Greek and modern Turkish nationalisms are sort of configured very differently. They have very different kinds of histories. Specifically, um, if we're talking about history, right? So um, if you're writing the history of your own group, uh, what kind of models, uh, precedents do you have? Or w- within what framework are you writing that history? Um, the Greeks of the 19th century had it pretty much ready-made. Uh, there already was a very well-developed Western discourse about the Greeks. It was valorized in very powerful, you know, positive ways. And so all they had to do was tap into it. And in fact, in some cases, just simply appropriate it. Uh, so... I, I mentioned Paparigopoulos earlier. I mean, his his originality is, I think, somewhat overstated in Greece uh, because he's the first person to write in Greek this sort of multi-volume history of the Greeks and so forth. But Five ages of Hellenism. Ages, right? yes, yeah. all the different phases. And he codified the ancient, medieval, modern phase. Like, okay, but a lot of that was already there. Uh, he just kind of put the pieces together. And we even know the Western historians, German, French, and English he was using. It's not, this is not a mystery. Yeah. Um, a colleague in Greece, uh, Kuburlis, has actually put all of this together. The Turkish nationalism is a completely different thing. Um, it's not as if, you know, in like 1900, there was like a, this historical framework for the history of the Turks and what their relationship was to the Ottoman Empire. In other words, if you were to look at the history of the Ottoman Empire and say, okay, who are the Turks in this? It's very difficult to find. Um, And so that was a much more difficult project in terms of conceptualization that was very much in parallel to the difficulty that even Kemal had in imagining a national state emerging from the the fragments of the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I. Um, And that was a very, very difficult process. Um, compounded in this particular case by the fact that, um, in a sense, the Turkish War of Independence <laughs> right, was a war against Greeks. So, you know, after World War I, the Greeks sort of kind of received permission to go and invade Western Asia Minor uh, in a campaign that in Greece is now remembered as the catastrophe. So I need not say more about how it went. Um, but in in defeating the Greeks in those battles was kind of the crucible of the independence of the Turkish nation. And so that's kind of woven into, you know, the Turkish story. Um, it, it's, it's one of these paradoxes that I, I point out sometimes that Greece and Turkey are the only countries I know that the only neighbors that define each other's independence against each other. <laughs> Um, and so that, yeah, that results in a pretty curious kind of dynamic. But um, I haven't studied the, the like the foundational sources of, of Turkish national history from the early 20th century to know exactly what role Byzantium plays in there. I'm pretty sure that it's there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yes. Um, again, shifting gears a little bit, there's a question about uh, sort of, I'm going to frame it this way, um, diasporic reception of Byzantium, particularly by Greeks. Um, and we could certainly talk about Greek Americans uh, or Greek Australians, but wh- wh- how does, in, in our sort of contemporary world where you have, you know, the, the Greek festivals every summer and, and there's, you know, Greek dancing in Euros, um, you know, certainly highlighting democracy. Um, where does 
where does Byzantium fit in? Of course, these happen at the churches, so maybe that's where, right. where, where does Byzantium fit in the reception, its, it's reception among the diaspora communities of Greeks in, in the world? It would be interesting, fascinating if someone were to study that. I mean, I don't have primary research about this at my disposal. I'll mention only two points, just sort of indicative. The first is that the it, it, it can emerge from the narrative that I presented. It, I mean, if, if you're paying close attention, um, too close perhaps, that the diaspora, the Greek diaspora was crucial uh, in the formative uh, moments and transitions of this history. In other words, in creating Greek identity, uh, sort of sponsoring it and promoting it in the West, justifying it, documenting it, prettifying it, right? It was the Greek diaspora that did a lot of that work that laid the foundations for the Philhellenism of the 19th century. That didn't happen in Greece. That didn't happen in you know, like the Peloponnese really. Um, so the diaspora played a very crucial role um, in the narrative of Hellenism and, and in, the, in the successful outcome of the war. That's the first uh, point that, that I'll say. But now that's like the diaspora of a while ago, not right now. Um, so as for right now, I, I mean, you made exactly the right point that the diaspora is largely organized around ecclesiastical institutions. Uh, not entirely, but in some places, mostly. Um, and I'll say this about those institutions. They're, they're sort of configured very interestingly. Um, and wait, we're talking about the Greek diaspora here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That the ecclesiastical institutions are not those of the Greek national state. They're those of the ecumenical patriarchate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not as if the Greek church, you know, which doesn't have a patriarch, it has an archbishop of Athens who presides over the synod, it's not as if it has branch offices that Greeks abroad interface with. They interface with the ecumenical patriarchate, which is a very different kind of dynamic. That patriarchate is configured differently internationally. It has a different structure. It's not exactly, it's not beholden to Greece in any sort of way. And so that is a different conception of orthodoxy than Greeks in Greece have, mm -hmm. right? Because the whole... The, the Church of Greece was formed very precisely to split from the patriarchate in the, again in the 19th century, actually around the time of the Crimean War, uh, in order to not be beholden to the patriarchate. Um, and so the, so the question then would be, is the ecumenical patriarchate of today sort of resonant of Byzantine institutions? Mm. And I mean, that would be an, you know, that's an interesting question in itself and would probably take us a little bit further away. Uh, now, the question is probably asked along the lines of, oh, you know, what do diaspora groups think of Byzantium or what do they, I, I don't, I can't speak for, for them, um, but it would be interesting if someone studied that, yes. Yeah, in, in my own, you know, I've had a lot of interactions with Greek American communities here in the United States, and, you know, a lot of their understanding of Byzantine history is what they learned in Greek school, you know, um, you know, taught uh, by lay people uh, primarily. Um, so these kind of questions I think are really interesting. And, and Alex Kittreff's book, a uh, recent book on the Greek Orthodox Church in America, I think would be really valuable for anyone out there who, who is curious about this question about the diasporic experience yeah. in America. Um, uh, could I, I mention, yeah. I, I'll just venture a hypothesis here, and this might be going out on a limb, but um, in terms of historical ideology, I sometimes feel that um, developments in Greece run ahead of what you see in diaspora groups. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, if your parents moved to the United States a gener two generations ago and, you know, you tend to retain older models. I, I don't mean older in some kind of evolutionary sense. I just mean they're from a different phase from when they left Greece. Right now in Greece, for example, I am seeing a great deal of skepticism about the, you know, model, the national continuity model. And I don't mean, so the continuity part, I mean that, that Byzantium is Greek and always was Greek and it should be claimed as a part of Greek history and that's all there is to it. You know, there were voices saying that sort of thing during the 20th century. I remember them when I was in school. I don't hear those voices that much anymore. And when I talk to, you know, young educated Greeks, uh, about this question, they're like mystified yeah. about what Byzantium is and where it fits in. And I think they're very open to 
uh, you know, alternative interpretations, interpretations that move them into um, other, uh, you know, historical domains that they can talk about, like Roman history and so forth. Um, let's remember that this whole, that, <laughs> uh, so a, a, a correspondent of mine once put it like this, that when Paparigopoulos kind of shoved Byzantine history into the Greek, you know, national continuity model, this was a little bit of a shotgun wedding. Uh, because he was doing that in part to counter these very racist theories uh, by this German historian, Falmerayer, early 19th century was arguing that there's no, like, well, what they called then blood, like biological continuity between ancient Greeks and modern Greeks. Yeah. Modern Greeks are all a bunch of these Slavs and Albanians who, who barely speak Greek. Um, and just was very shocking and insulting to modern Greeks. Uh, and so the, the, the narrative of continuity was kind of a, a uh, an emergency response to that. That's not the best circumstance under which to produce good history. Um, <laughs> and I don't think- posture, it, yeah, you're right. Yeah, there. yeah. I don't think it was done well either. Mm -hmm. That is, even if you were to, wanted to tell the story of Byzantium as a phase in Greek history, I mean, you can do that, it's fine, but I don't think it would need to be, it would have to be configured along very different lines. Um, and so I think there's openness to this, yeah. um, which brings me back to the question uh, of, uh, of the audience member. Which I think there might be a bit of a disjunction between how Byzantium is perceived in Greece and how it's perceived in diasporic communities, especially if they're organized around um, the, the local church. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% um, right on that. Um, you know, and as a child of immigrants, I know, you know, in my own experience, mm -hmm. you know, when my parents came, they brought with them, you know, the culture of Korea, South Korea in the 1970s. And certainly it changes over time, but there's a kind of um, preservation of that memory of what they, they brought with them um, that, that lasts. And, and in, I don't know if you want to call it a conservatism, but, but, but yeah. it's an older way, as you said, yeah, right? Yeah. And I think of obviously Greeks have been in America a lot longer um, and there are multiple generations of this, but nevertheless, I think there is a kind of passing down of a particular reception that, um, doesn't follow what's going on right. in the homeland that the immigrants originally left. Um, yeah. Okay, one final question, <laughs> uh, and and I'm sorry to those audience members for whom I couldn't an uh, ask Anthony all these other questions, but uh, this comes from Garth Foden actually. Um, so Fergus Miller relished the evident paradoxes in what you're saying in his Greek Roman Empire. Couldn't we treat this as a transitional phase in our discourse on the way to renaming, but also reconceiving and reorganizing the field as East Roman studies, somewhat in the same way that Peter Brown re reorganized late Roman studies by calling it late antiquity. So could Byzantine studies become East Roman studies and uh, thereby kind of revitalizing and, and living with the tensions? Hi, Garth. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, that that is a very, uh, that's a viable option. Um, so um, yeah, Fergus Miller's book, uh, Greek Roman Empire, is very much about that kind of moment of transition, like how, how do you get from a Latin Western Roman Empire to a Greek Eastern Roman Empire? Um, at that time, it, which is not just Greek, uh, but he also talks about the, the Syriac and the you know, Coptic populations, um, and, and Fergus Miller did a lot of work on those kinds of linguistic groups within the Eastern Empire. Uh, so we have to also recognize them, uh, right? So it, it, it shouldn't be anything monolithically Greek, uh, but yeah, East Roman might be a good kind of umbrella term for everything going on uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean in, in, the, in the period that uh, we're concerned with. Um, Romaic might be another, I, I don't know. Um, if, if there weren't a modern country, we, Romanian would work because the the term that the the term that the Byzantines used for their state and society starting in the fourth century and possibly earlier was Romania. This is where it comes from. It's from the very beginning. It was a street term. Uh, it was it was part of the vernacular, explicitly so. Romania and and Rome. So is where we get Romaic and so. But Romanian has its own. You know, it's taken. So. It's taken. Uh, Not it. <laughs> reservations are made. So, well, yes. on that note, um, I guess we'll continue to call it uh, Byzantine studies with all of the complexities and nuances yes. that you've unpacked.
Uh, but I want to thank you so much for, um, you know, being a great conversation partner and enlightening us and, um, you know, and to all of our audience members out there. Thank you. And of course, to our organizers for putting this together. Uh, what, what a privilege it thank is. You, to yeah. do this. So thank you. Anthony, no, thank you for doing this over, too. Uh, to our host, Daphne. Thank you both for this amazing talk. Um, I think after this, this talk, many of us will continue to, to think about the term Byzantium and when we use it, we'll be much more conscious about it and uh, also follow up the, the following publications. And uh, well, if there's a change in the, in the use of the term to Romaic Roma or East Roman, well, there will be uh, lots of work to do afterwards, thinking about the librarian and archivist perspective. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. well, <laughs> on that note, also thank you, uh, dear listeners, for uh, for being with us, and all, and thank you for all your questions. Um, before closing this talk, I would like to um, briefly give information about our next talk, uh, which is which will happen next month on the first Thursday of uh, October. Uh, it will be on maritime archaeology. And the speakers will be Matthew Harpster and Michael Jones from Koch University. So uh, don't forget to um, follow us, uh, checking our um, social media and our website. More information will be given there. And again, thank you all uh, for this talk and see you next month. Bye, everyone.